Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. The case that I'm going to look into today was actually suggested by my Patreon member so that was Kerule. So thank you so much for that. I appreciate you supporting me in that way obviously. You don't have to, you know, watch my videos and stuff and supporting my channel is fantastic but then to go like the extra little bit is just amazing. So I can't thank you enough. Um, you might notice in this video that my hair is pretty red because I've dyed it and I'm gonna bring this video forward because obviously it's a Patreon one. So yeah, just thank you so much for joining it. It means the world to me. Anyway, let's get on to the case. This is the case of the murder of Lynn Harper and how a young boy, Stephen Truscott, was the one who got convicted of her murder and not only was he convicted, he was sentenced to death by hanging. Stephen ended up being the youngest death row inmate in Canada at the time after one of the most famous trials. Now let me just say here, this case still holds a lot of controversy around it. People still, I don't want to get too much into it before I get into it, but people are very much either this side or this side. So as you already know, he was found guilty. We will go through the case, but people still, some people believe that he did it and some people don't. That's all I'm going to say. Obviously, I'm gonna give everything that I could find. I want you guys to make your own minds up on that one, obviously. I know what my opinion of the case is, which I will share with you at the end, but just let me take you through the case and take you back to the 9th of June in 1959, which would be the last day that Lynn Harper would ever be seen alive again. She was balancing on the handlebars of her one of her classmates bike, Stephen Truscott. Cheryl Lynn Harper was born on the 31st of August in 1946 to parents Leslie and Shirley in New Brunswick in Canada. She had an older brother who was called Barry. Now he didn't live with them at the time, I don't believe. I think he lived off in Ohio. She also had a younger brother called Jeffrey. She was pretty much known to family and friends as Lynn, so that's how I'm gonna obviously refer to her because that was that was what everyone called her. Now, Leslie, her father, was initially a teacher, but then in 1940, he got a job with the military. He was going to join the Air Force as a flying officer. And as a result of this, it meant that the family would have to move around a lot. In July of 1957, he was stationed at the RCF, RCAF base in Clinton, which is the Royal Canadian Air Force base. I don't even know if I've said those letters in the right order, but you, you get what I mean. Which was in Ontario. So the family, again, they were used to moving around anyway, so they moved to this base in Clinton. And then they started making a life, a life for themselves. You know, they lived there pretty much nearly two years. And Lynn made lots of friends in that time. You know, she was quite popular. She was described as being a very energetic girl and even described later by people as a bit of a live wire. A few kids did say that she was bossy, but I mean, you know, a lot of kids are bossy and things at that age. She ended up joining the Girl Guides and she would attend Bible class and Sunday school. So she would enjoy her faith and be quite involved in it, doing a lot of things with regards to it. Lynn was apparently quite small for her age, but she loved doing things like PE. She loved playing baseball. Lynn was... She was very helpful towards her mother. She would help talk with the housework and things like that. But obviously sometimes they would argue. I mean, everyone does, doesn't they? You know, kids argue with the parents. It's just one of them things. Apparently Shirley had rheumatism, so her daughter would help a lot around the house, you know, to help her mom. There was some sort of accident that happened in Lynn's childhood. She ended up with a small scar on her face, which sometimes she'd be self-conscious of, but generally she was just a typical little girl, enjoying spending time with friends having crushes on boys, she did well in school, she was an above average student, you know, she was just a normal little girl. Stephen Truscott was born on the 18th of January in 1945 in Vancouver to his parents Dan and Doris. Dan was a non-commissioned Air Force officer and they had arrived in the Clinton base in 1956, which was a year before the Harper family was actually transferred there. 
So that's a little bit of background on the two main people involved in this case. And as you go through it, you will find, well, I found it very sad that this trial was massive and Lynn's murder in all of it kind of does get a bit lost, which is really sad. I mean, you'll see as we get through it, but not that I'm trying to diminish Stephen's part in it because I think what happened to him was awful. So that's just a little bit about the pair. Now let's get into the ins and outs of this case. We're now on the 9th of July in 1959. Lynn had gone to school like any other day. She'd attended a ball game after school and that meant that she was gonna be a bit late home. I believe it finished at about half five. Then one of her teachers, Miss Helen Blur, gave Lynn a lift home after the ball game. When she was heading home, she wanted to go swimming. She was really looking forward to going like the basic swimming pool. So she got home and then she went back out. Now, she didn't actually have a permit to be able to swim alone and the people at the pool would not actually let her swim unsupervised. So even though she really wanted to go out swimming, she ended up not being able to do it and she ended up coming home again. She got home at about 6.15 and then she decided that she was gonna go out again and go out for a walk. That was the last time that Shirley saw her daughter. She watched her walk up Victoria Boulevard and then turn onto Winnipeg Road. And that was it. As I said, she'd gone out for a walk. She walked for about 45 minutes and this is when she start, saw Stephen. He was on the school grounds. He was a classmate. He was a little older than Lynn. He was 14 and she was 12. But you know, they actually shared a class together and so that is how they kind of knew each other. He was on his bicycle. And that was just after 7 p.m. Stephen, just like Lynn, lived in the ma permanent married quarters on the base. Now, there's two different stories here that I've read on different sources. I am not entirely sure which is the correct one, so I will give you both. But I have seen that she had said to Stephen that she wanted to go to Highway 8 because she wanted to go and see a man who had these ponies and she wanted to go and see his ponies. Because of that, she asked if she could sort of catch a ride on his bike with him. But I also read in a different source that she actually had told him that she wanted to go and see her grandma, which was, and she was going to hitchhike a ride, a ride, a ride to her grandmother's community, which wasn't that close, that far away. So I don't actually know which is the actual one. So if you, if anybody does know, then please do let me know in the comments below. But I thought I'd put them both in there because I have read them both. Whichever one is true, she asked him if she could ride double on his bike and he was already going to something called Bayfield River which was very close to Highway 8 so he agreed. He was going there to see whether any of his friends were there. You know, it was a, it was a massive hangout for kids in them days that, by that river so, you know, he was going to check whether any of his mates were there. They set off, they head towards Bayfield River and over this river is a bridge. The road carries on up on the right hand side, there is something called Lawson's Brush, which is this big forest area. It is owned by a farmer. We'll get more into that in a little bit. So they pass Lawson's Brush and they head up over this bridge, which is over the Bayfield River. They carry on a little bit up the road and that gets you to sort of the crossroad, the intersection of Highway 8. This is where he said that he dropped Lynn off she gets off the bike, he turns around, he heads back towards the bridge and at some point he actually looks back to see what, you know, where Lynn is and then he sees Lynn getting into a car. It was a grey late model Chevrolet and there were, he said that there was a lot of chrome on the car so it could have been a Bel Air model but that it was like a brand new model pretty much. It was a new style car. With what he thought, were yellow license plates which probably were out of state. He also saw this red sort of mark on the car which he thought may have been a sticker. Something I actually missed off the source were she told him that she was going to her grandma's. She actually said that she'd had an argument with her parents and then she was going to hitchhike a ride to go and see her grandma. So again, I don't know which is which. I don't know whether she was going to see a man, trying to hitchhike to go and see a man with ponies or trying to hitchhike to go and see her grandma even if she had an argument with her parents. I don't actually know just because there's just conflicting information on that. What I do know and unfortunately none of these children did was that that would be the end of two childhoods, both of their childhoods. 
And it's just so sad what happened to them both. So Stephen does a couple more things and then he's seen back around the base at 8pm by people, by lots of people. Then shortly after that, he goes back home and he is babysitting for the rest of the evening. So he literally spends a very short time with Lynn and that will come into play later on. You, you will see, trust me. Stephen made it back home, but Lynn did not. It got to 11pm. Obviously, the Harper family were absolutely pulling their hair out as to where their daughter was and Leslie reports her missing at the station guardhouse. The Ontario Provincial Police, which is the OPP, led a massive search for Leslie. It was, don't forget, this is like back in 1959, you know, and it was at an air, like a military base. It was a massive shock that she had gone missing and I guess initially they would have thought they wouldn't have probably assumed foul play but unfortunately that was the case which they will find out and I, I but they're probably just thinking that she's off somewhere just I don't know injured ran away something like that at this point anyway they they lead a massive search 250 military civilians along with the police all trying to find her whilst looking into her disappearance they quickly found out that stephen truscott was one of the last people to have seen her so don't forget she went missing on the 9th we're now on the 10th of june and at 9 30 in the morning stephen was interviewed by constable hobbs who was sat in his cruiser at stephen's school again he told him the story that i've told you that Yes, he did have Lynn riding double on his bike, but, you know, he dropped her off at intersection 8. He drove back to the bridge and then he saw her get in a car, this sh this grey Chevrolet. The search does continue and then two days later, they find Lynn. This is the 11th of June, 1959. And it was just two months before her 30th birthday, which is just, it just makes it w worse. Even though the worst had already happened to her, but just... I don't know, two months away from her birthday, it's so sad. Lynn Harper was found deceased in a woodlot off a neighbourhood farm. Remember Lawson's Brush that I told you about earlier? Well, the farm that she was found on was owned by Bob Lawson and that area was known locally as Lawson's Brush. Well, that is where they found her. She was found partially nude and she had been sexually assaulted and then strangled with her own blouse. Her body was also covered in cuts and bruises all over. And it may have been the case because I believe they had to go over or through a barbed wire fence to get to the area where she was found. So possibly whoever had taken her there, maybe she had gotten the cuts and bruises from the barbed wire, from self-defense, trying to fend off her attacker. You know, she could have got them a few different ways, but the barbed wire is like a very likely one because you know scratches things like that off the bad wire the authorities knew that they had a murder investigation on their hands now and it sent shockwaves through the community as i said i don't know they just they probably didn't think that this was power play and then when they found her body and she'd been sexually assaulted and she was a child it just honestly everyone was devastated and surprised they just didn't really think that something like this would ever happen but then nobody ever does. The attorney general at the time was called Kelso Roberts. He posted a $10,000 reward for the person that did this to Lynn to be found dead or alive, which was pretty much unheard of. The money, I, I mean, in that time, like, you know, they didn't really put such a big amount on something like that. So that just goes to show like how, how much it shocked everyone and how much they wanted to find out who had done this. Now, the authorities did a brief investigation, and when I say brief, I mean brief. They basically uncovered during that that a lot of kids would spend their time on the Lawson farm around Lawson's brush. They would do odd jobs, you know, chores for him, help him out on the farm, and they would also just hang out and just, you know, just play and be kids. Some of those kids that used to play around there a lot included Lynn and Stephen. And that really didn't bode well for Stephen because not only was he the last person to be known to have been with her, he is now known to, you know, be around the area that her body was found in quite a lot, playing there and things like that. So I believe from the scene, they took some insect samples and things like that into evidence. But 
they never did anything with those which is frustrating because due to insects and things like that from bodies sometimes well a lot of the time you can find their time of death from things like that but you know they never ever use that they just took it all into evidence they completed their investigation and on the 12th of june just after 7 p.m stephen being their immediate suspect straight away was taken into custody he was interviewed for hours bearing in mind he was 14 i don't believe he had a lawyer present he he said a few things that were contradicting and things like that and that he weren't exactly clear and the police just used that as more evidence against him in their eyes like that he actually did this not the fact that he was a kid himself his parents weren't there he had no lawyer and he had been interviewed for hours and hours and hours he was frightened to death you know he would have been tired probably at that point and scared but none of that was taken into like account and at 2 30 a.m the next morning on the 13th he was charged with first degree murder under the juvenile delinquent act let me just say here as well bob lawson the farm owner he actually reported to one of the guard houses at the base at seeing a strange car parked near his land um near one of his fences the night that lynn actually disappeared which obviously was something that stephen didn't had he he did not have a car he was 14. he claimed that this car was possibly a convertible possibly a 52 ford and not only did bob see this his neighbor ross critch had also seen this car and claimed that he had seen a man in the driver's seat along with what appeared to be a shorter girl next to him neither of whom they recognized he didn't recognize you know the car the people in it whether that was lynn or related to the case in any way i do not know but it just put into perspective that there were other suspects in this case and they could have looked not only at stephen which they heavily focused on they could have looked at other people too i will get into the other suspects later on but i just wanted to put that in there just to show you that the police just really focused on stephen and didn't really look into anybody else at all on the 30th of june despite stephen being 14 it was ordered that he would be tried as an adult which meant either a life sentence or a death sentence he also was not allowed bail and i think that's mainly because of how much it rumbled and shocked the community and they just did not want him to be out on bail like at all not that that should really influence it because normally bail's like a set amount of money you pay and they get out but he, he wasn't allowed that now the inspector sort of heading the case was called harold graham now he will he will come into play a lot during this case but he basically felt like it was Stephen. they had the man it was nobody else you know once really explained how Stephen could have committed this rape and murder especially when after the fact people saw him you know later on he was seen around town he was seen by his parents and not what not once was he rattled scared acting strange he didn't have he wasn't dirty he didn't have any scratches on him any marks on him whatsoever if he had fought with lynn if if those wounds off lynn were defensive you know he would have had some scratches or something or if she had got them off the barbed wire whoever would have took her in there possibly would have been nicked on the barbed wire too you know they would have something they would be dirty they would be something even just the clothes disheveled or the person especially since him being 14 if he'd have create like committed such a heinous act you would have assumed i mean not not always the case because some people do surprise you some people can commit these horrible things and just be totally normal after you know but he was 14 you would have thought that it would have affected him in some way or another but people said he was calm just normal Stephen, and nothing seemed out of the ordinary everything was clean calm collected just completely normal not only that it was a very warm night the night that murder lynn was murdered so you would at the very least expect him to be sweating because if he has fought with somebody to sexually assault them and then to strangle them at the very least he would have been sweating but 
no, nothing. He was just, just normal. None of the police officers that interviewed him after the fact noticed anything wrong with him, anything different, nothing. And they noted again that he was just very calm. There was also two witnesses that came forward to say that they had seen Stephen at the bridge. So one said that they had seen him, him and Lynn riding double, going across that bridge. And then a short while later, Stephen coming back without Lynn and standing on the bridge and looking back. So that is what one of these boys said that they had seen. Another one who was out playing in the river at the time had said that he had also ste seen Stephen on that bridge. Now, seeing Stephen on the bridge is pretty integral to this case. The reason behind that is because for Stephen to have committed this rape and murder, he would have ha he would have never been on that bridge. So Lawson's Brush, as you're going up that road, Lawson's Brush is on your, I don't know, say it's on your right hand side as you're going up, you, you then pass it, cross that bridge, and then you get to intersection eight. But they're trying to put Stephen as the murderer and in doing so, they're trying to prove that he never made it to that bridge and that instead, he and Lynn turned off up the little track to Lawson's brush and that is when he assaulted and killed her. So therefore, he was never ever on that bridge that night. So these two people saying that they saw him is pretty integral in the case. Now, there are also other children involved in this case who said that he was never on the bridge. We will get into them more and things in the trial, but I just wanted to put these two in, you know, and I know it's more like, you know, you've got some saying that he was there, some saying that he wasn't, who do you believe? But these people who have stated this, even into their adulthood, have said that they saw Stephen on that bridge that day. Whereas the others, their stories changed quite a lot. Again, we, I'll show you. You will find out. So, one of the most famous trials in Canadian history began on the 16th of September in 1959. And it would last only 15 days. Which isn't a very long trial. They had a very brief investigation where they pretty much just said Stephen did it straight away. And then they have a trial that lasts just over two weeks. <sighs> it just... You know, sometimes trials can last months, but this one lasted literally 15 days. And I don't know, I just think that's a very short time to try and do a trial, but you know, who am I? So the prosecution based their case off the fact that Lynn would never hitchhike anywhere, basically. She would never get in a car with a stranger. She was a very cautious girl, she just wouldn't do it. And I'm not saying that she would, but if she had possibly had an argument with her parents, she had no other way of getting anywhere. And at the time, nobody really, I don't know, did people really see the dangers of hitchhiking in that time? I don't believe that they did. I'm not saying that she would have definitely got in the car with someone because I don't know. But her parents and the prosecution said that she definitely would not have. They again alleged that Stephen took Lynn to Lawson's Brush and that, as I've already said, they never crossed the bridge that day. He then sexually assaulted Lynn and strangled her with her own clothing. He then arranged a few tree branches around her body to try and hide her remains and then went about his day like normal. They obviously highlighted the inconsistent statements that he'd made to police as well as this mysterious abrasion that he had on his penis. So he was actually looked over by two doctors, two different doctors at the time and they said that he had these abrasions on his penis that could have been lichen that probably were there due to a sexual assault. I don't really understand that, but that may just be me. But let me just add here, he was actually seen by a third doctor a little bit later on who said that there was nothing on his penis whatsoever. So whether you think that this was, I don't know, tailored for the case or not, that is up to you but a third doctor did see them and said that there was nothing there so they also questioned as to why Stephen didn't say anything about Lynn getting into that car before like until like after a day later but I mean if hitchhiking was just a normal thing then and you see her she said that she's gonna hitchhike and you see her getting into a car you probably don't think much more of it after that he was again a child himself maybe he just didn't think anything of it 
Finally, they cited evidence that there were f- fresh tyre, like bicycle tracks that were leading down the track path, which was, you know, heading towards where Lynn's body was found. The, the evidence that they had was all circumstantial. And let me just say about the tyre marks, kids went in there all the time. So, you know, before her body was dumped in there, a kid could have drove through there. They was in there all over the time, but you know, they were saying that those tyre tracks were definitely Stevens. Again, it was just all circumstantial. They had no legit proof that Stephen was the one who committed this crime. But, you know, the trial continued. His defence lawyer, Frank Donnelly, said that, no, in fact, he did take Lynn over that bridge to intersection eight where she got off his handlebars. That was hundreds of metres past the tractor trail and therefore it was very unlikely that he had murdered her because you would then have to take her all the way back and then take her into Lawson's brush to then kill her. And again, the police were trying to prove that he never got to that bridge. So they did not believe that he had gone up there, come back with Lynn and then gone into the, the brush. You know, they were trying to prove that he had never made it up to that bridge in the first place. They stated over and over again his defence that she got into a car that day. A 1959 Chevrolet was the car that picked her up. You know, he saw it, he had witnesses who saw him on the bridge that day. The thing with this case is that timing is literally everything in it. And I mean everything. So I've already told you that he was seen back at the base at eight by numerous people. He then spent the rest of the evening in his house and he met up with Lynn just after seven. So they had to, don't bear in mind, they have to factor in his journey from where he met Lynn, surrounded by other people, to him driving up there, right? To loss to, to the Lawson Brush area. They had a very small window of which to try and prove that that is when Lynn died. Because if she had died in that very small window when she was with Stephen, then, you know, it was more likely that he actually did it. Because if, it, if she died anywhere after eight, he couldn't have possibly done it because he was at home kind of thing. Well, let me tell you, they did just that. And the means of how they got there, to me, was just ridiculous. And has been pretty much sniggered upon all these years later. So the pathologist, John Pennystan, was the one who did the autopsy on Lynn. And he found out her time of death within half an hour, literally, from her stomach contents. Yeah, her stomach contents. He testified that her half digested stomach contents showed that Lynn had died exactly between quarter past seven and quarter to eight that night. Now I've looked into this and it is said that you can't get a precise time of death off stomach contents. They don't tell you very much. Well, what they last ate, I guess, and you know, things like that, but not not time of death wise. It is not used as to try and determine someone's time of death because it's very unreliable in doing so. I've also looked up and watched many videos on this case. Other experts have said that getting a time of death from stomach contents just isn't done. I watched a video made by the Fifth Estate and a doctor on there called John Butt said that it was an impossible deduction and that stomach contents tell doctors nothing precise about their time of death. However, This narrow window of opportunity that he said that she had died within proved to be damning evidence against Stephen. It didn't matter at the time that, you know, that is not taken as a time of death, really. They don't really do that, but it was enough for the trial. And I honestly believe that just the shock of how Lynn was sexually assaulted and murdered just the sheer horror of it and the fact that Stephen at 14 could have done this. I believe that that is what whirlwinded this case, honestly, because they just had no evidence against him. And yet, I don't know. They, the evidence that they then had was like the stomach contents, which they said proved that he did it kind of thing. But you're not even supposed to do a time of death off of that. So uh, I don't know. They also stated that the possibility of a stranger picking up Lynn on that highway and being able to get her to the brush and strangling her within that time frame made it very unlikely. Therefore, it must have been Stephen. The trial featured a massive deal of 
testimonies from children because they were the, they were all around there they were the witnesses you know that is who it involved they were playing around the bridge that day it involved all of those people so i've already told you that two boys said that they had seen stephen there were two other main people involved in this case who said that he wasn't there but not only did they give conflicting accounts either because they were vindictive or mistaken they also tried to get i believe it was bob lawson i may be wrong with that because i'm just trying to sort of remember that information but they tried to convince somebody else to change their story too an adult i believe which obviously they said no honestly this case man seriously the prosecution's star witness was called jocelyn gardet there was also another one called arnold butch george he was known as butch by everyone they were both schoolmates of Lynn and Stephen. Both were said that they were around the bridge at the time, said that they didn't see Stephen. They changed their stories several times. They tried to get other people to change their stories to match theirs, but that didn't stop the prosecu prosecution from putting them on the stand. Even though they were clearly unreliable witnesses because they're changing their story left, right and centre. That didn't matter. Just a little side note as well, neither one of these people have spoke to the press as an adult, but I did see that several nurses that trained in the 1960s said that they knew a woman who called herself Kim. Well, this woman was actually Jocelyn Gardet. They knew that. And one of those nurses signed an affidavit to say that Jocelyn had actually told her that she had lied on the stand and knew that Stephen Truscott was innocent. Obviously, this was later down the line. It wasn't at the trial stage, but I just wanted to put it in here just to show how unreliable their testimonies were. And the thing with putting children on the stand is that they might not actually remember everyone that they saw that day or <sighs> their kids. And there was nothing remarkable about that day. It was until obviously Lynn, you know, was went missing, which was later on. They did, she wasn't reported until 11. It was just a normal day. They had testimony from a child that was walking up the road. I believe he was 10 years old. He was walking down the road that day. He said that he had seen all these different people on the road, but he never mentioned Stephen's name, Stephen and Lynn. So he was around the bridge that time and they used that as evidence that Stephen and Lynn, Lynn never crossed that bridge. But there was also other names that he didn't mention and he was 10. Who's to say that he wasn't spaced out walking down that road and didn't notice who he had seen? Personally, if I was walking down the road as a kid, I'm not going to take note of everybody that passes me because I, why? I actually don't care. Nothing remarkable was done that day apart from later on. So why would they remember everybody that they saw? They just wouldn't. It just doesn't make any sense. But I guess all they had were children and what else could they do? They wanted to get a conviction for this. And I get, you know, I get that. Obviously, everyone wants to find out who killed Lynn. But you don't want to make all the evidence try and fit somebody who possibly was innocent. And normally, it's innocent until proven guilty. And I don't believe that they actually proved Stephen as guilty. Because they just didn't have the evidence to place him there. And that can be frustrating in cases when all the circumstantial evidence does point to that person, but then they never get convicted because there's no actual evidence to prove it. But in this case, you know, it, it was the opposite. So despite their star witnesses constantly changing their stories, every time they got up on that stand, it changed. Despite those two boys claiming that they had definitely seen Stephen on the bridge with and without Lynn, and their stories never changed. They were ironclad. They never changed. They have never changed to this day. And one adult had an interview on the Fifth Estate who swears by what he saw that day. He saw Stephen on that bridge. And again, the other two whose stories changed have never spoken to the press as adults. So what does that tell you? And I'm not saying that Stephen certainly didn't do it. I'm just saying that they didn't have the evidence to prove it. Stephen Truscott was convicted on the 30th of September after a 15 day trial despite circumstantial evidence. He was sentenced to death by hanging, becoming the youngest person in Canadian history to receive the death sentence at the age of 14. On the 21st of January in 1960, Stephen Truscott did an appeal which was dismissed. Now immediately after they did commute his sentence from uh, 
capital punishment to a life sentence. And this case is actually credited with abolishing Canada's capital punishment. So the death penalty after this case was gone. You know, it no longer existed. They didn't want to do it anymore, which is one good thing at least to come of this case. On 24th February, he put in an application for leave, which was also denied. He did a lot of appeals over the years and they were denied. So we have this 14 year old boy who was in prison. He cried himself to sleep most nights, but then he realized that he just had to adapt. He, he had to adapt to survive. He had to toughen up and basically become an adult losing his childhood because he didn't have any other choice. If he didn't, he wouldn't have survived. So that's what he did. He proclaimed, proclaimed his innocence during the entire time and still does to this day. And all his appeals and things were denied every single time. Let me just say as well, the theory of Lynn's time of death based off stomach contents is, to this, is now discredited. Even the doctor that said it in the first place backed away from it after testifi testifying at a Supreme Court in 1966. So even the person that said it was then just walked away from it. He did a reassessment and he concluded that Lynn could have died up to 12 hours after her last meal. So yeah, the one thing that the one thing that got Stephen and they thought was actual evidence that pinned it to him and it must have been him because of that years later said yeah she might have died up to 12 hours after her last meal who knows I've, I've, honestly Stephen spent 10 years in jail before being paroled in 1969 and he went to live with his parole officer and his family he eventually moved out where he would live anonymously leaving the name Stephen Truscott behind using the name Stephen Bowers he got married to his wife Melaine and he raised her three children on the 6th of April in 2006, Lynn Harper's body was exhumed in order to do some DNA testing. There was a hope that it would bring some closure to the case. I believe finally certified that Stephen was guilty like he had been proven all those years ago. Or that, you know, it would prove his innocence. But unfortunately, the DNA that they recovered was unusable. Over the years, Stephen and his family have tried to get his conviction overturned. And finally, on the 28th of August in 2007, they did just that. Stephen Truscott was acquitted of the charges by the court, by the Ontario Court of Appeal. His defence team had originally asked for a declaration of innocence, which would mean that he would be declared fully incident, innocent of, you know, Lynn's murder completely, and not merely what they were now claiming was that unable to be found guilty beyond reasonable doubt. They did issue the acquittal, but they said that they were not in a position to declare Stephen Truscott innocent of the crime. The Attorney General of Ontario, on behalf of the government, apologised to Stephen, stating that they were truly sorry for the miscarriage of justice. Oh, and another thing that I haven't yet mentioned. Do you remember the lead detective in this case, who I said, you know, he really pushed for Stephen, he said it was him, he had his man, blah 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 well later on he would actually become the ontario's provincial police commissioner so yeah he got a huge pay rise after solving solving this murder so that is everything about the trial and all the controversies surrounding lynn harper's murder and as i said in the beginning unfortunately with the huge miscarriage of justice that happened to Stephen. And the huge trial that was super famous, Lynn's murder did get lost in it all, which I find really sad. I'm not trying to diminish what happened to Stephen because personally, going through this case, I don't believe that he did it. I believe that he is innocent. That is just a personal opinion. Obviously, you guys make your own minds up on what you believe, but I truly don't think that he did. So I'm not trying to diminish what happened to Stephen because he spent his life he spent 10 years of it in jail. He then came out of jail, left behind his own name because he wanted to be living anonymity and not be hassled by people. And then it took all them years for him to be, for his conviction to be overturned. You know, what happened to him was awful. But Lynn lost her life. And it seems like because Stephen was wrongly convicted in my eyes, I don't know. They didn't look into who her other possible suspects could have been and who possibly could have actually murdered her. And then 
As a result of that, I don't believe that this case will ever be solved. Because I believe that in the law's eyes, they still think that Steven did it. And I don't know, they're not going to look into anyone else. A lot of the other suspects have already passed away at this point. And I just find it so sad, this case. Honestly, I really do. So let's get into other possible suspects and who they could have been. There was an electrician who worked on the Clinton base at least one time a week. And he did leave, live in Seaforth at the time, but he would travel to the Clinton base and he would work there. And he actually had a rape conviction from 1948 and spent like three and a half years in jail. He had actually been in the Harper home before she was taken. I believe that there was a clothes dryer or something that needed repairing. So he had actually been in their home and he had been done for sexual assault. He is a possible suspect in her murder. There was another suspect who had actually been accused of sexual assault by his grown daughters. He lived in a village just north of the Clinton base and one of the, his daughters actually said that when she was six, she was in her father's car. She actually hid in it for some reason or another and he took the car out. So she was in there, he didn't know. She said that he stopped, he took the car out for a drive. He then stopped at this gravel road. He then went around to the boot, opened the boot and then she said, this is what she claimed, that she saw him carrying the limp body of a young girl into a wooded area down that gravel road. He spent half an hour there around about before returning back to the car and then driving off. So again, she was six at the time, who knows whether that was actually what she saw or whatever, but it's a potential suspect in her case. I mean, it's pretty damn specific as well to, to accuse your own father of doing that. So I don't know. There was actually a convicted sex offender who actually lived in the Clinton base at the round of, at the time of Lynn Harper being there and being murdered. But they didn't actually find out about him until 1997 after being contacted by a retired police detective who thought that this man could have been capable of killing Lynn Harper. He had apparently pled guilty to several offenses. He had indecent images of children in the late 1980s. When the police actually did go ahead and search his house, they found an eight volume transcript of Stephen Truscott's hearing before the Supreme Court between the years of 1966 to 67. See, there are quite a few suspects. Another possible suspect was a man that retired OPP Sergeant Barry Rule used the pseudonym of Larry Talbot in the book that he created. He did a 30 year investigation into the career criminal and apparent alleged serial killer. He first came into contact with him after he had sexually assaulted his fiance and shot a pellet gun after her. He chased him out of the cottage, caught up to him. I believe there was a brief struggle, but he did manage to arrest him. Now, this Larry Talbot drove a gray 1957 Chevrolet. It was a Bella model, similar to the model that obviously Stephen Truscott had described that Lynn had gotten into. Larry Talbot was also this traveling salesman who had contracts with the Clinton base and therefore he was known to be there quite often. He also would have been very familiar with the area too. Other evidence that Barry Rule claimed was that the shoe size of Larry Talbot matched a shoe that was found in Lawson's brush at the time. There was a sample of type A blood found at the scene and Larry Talbot was type A blood. He was apparently also a suspect in several unsolved cases. He has been interviewed several times for all these different things by police and whatnot, but nothing has ever come of it. And at the time he was pursued for quite a, for a little bit of time, but it was said that it wasn't long enough. Like they didn't look into him enough. They didn't follow him enough. But by the time that this information came to light years later, and it was reevaluated decades later, it was already too late because Larry Talbot had actually died before police be could finish their investigation. So he could be a viable suspect as well, but we will never know because he is no longer here. Another possible suspect in Lynn Harper's case is a man named Alexander Kelchuk. He was a Royal Canadian Air Force surgeon who lived and worked in the area at the time of Lynn's murder. He was known to be a heavy drinker. He also had previous accusations of sexual assault on minors, children, little girls. In 1957, he did actually get transferred from the Clinton base to about an hour away, but 
He would often make frequent trips back to Clinton as where he lived was like a 20 minute drive from that airbase. He was charged by the OPP of attempting to lure three young girls into his car. This was later dismissed, but the timing of it was 12 days before Lynn, Lynn's murder. So he was literally in the Clinton base area trying to lure three children into his car 12 days before Lynn was murdered herself. He just got a warning for that basically and that was literally on the day that Lynn disappeared when he got that warning. Now, interestingly enough as well, three weeks after Lynn Harper's murder, Alexander was hospitalised. He was hospitalised due to overwhelming anxiety, depression and guilt over something. Police began warning people in the community about the activities of an unidentified sexual offender who was like trying to lure in young girls from his car but despite all of that somehow he managed to avoid detection for years i believe that somebody actually looking into this before the clinton airbase closed or something like that is when all of this stuff was found like they found his personnel file on his mental state and all of the things that he did and that is when it all came to light so he managed to avoid detection all of them years and he ended up drinking himself to death in 1975 he spent his final days in Godric Psychiatric Hospital, wandering the street, wandering around, dishevelled, and in the final stages of alcoholism. It has never actually been confirmed as to whether Sergeant Alexander Kolichek was ever investigated with regards to the murder of Lynn Harper. And that is basically it. Those are all possible suspects. And I mean, there are a lot. So how can you possibly say that Stephen Truscott was the one who killed Lynn Harper without any evidence when they have all of these other potential suspects who possibly could have done it. The murder of Lynn Harper is still an open case to this day. Obviously, bearing in mind it is a very cold case at this point, and as I've said before, it's likely to never ever be solved unless there's a confession or someone talks about something that somebody told them, but in like the 62 years that have passed, no one has talked as of yet. So yeah, I don't believe they ever will. And a lot of people have passed away since, you know. It's just really sad because to this day, Lynn Harper's murder case remains unsolved. And again, how lost her murder got in all of this when they just focused on Stephen. As I've said, personally, I do not believe that he did this. I do believe he's innocent and that he was just a victim in all of this as well. And his trial and things got so massive that Lynn, who was the... The, the one that lost her life, she got lost in it all, which I find so sad. I would like to know what your guys' opinions on it. Do you believe, uh, like me, that Stephen is innocent, that he was wrongly convicted, or do you believe that he did this to Lynn? Please let me know in the comments below. This case I found so interesting, so frustrating, you know, and just so tragic all around, but I don't know. Hopefully one day it will get solved, although I do not think it ever will. But yeah, that is the end of the case. If you guys have enjoyed this video, give me a big thumbs up, subscribe to the channel for similar content. Anyway guys, that's all I have today on the murder of Lynn Harper. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, bye.